Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Big Gardner Web Seminar on Film Thickness and Adhesion of Coatings. I'm coming to you from uh, Big Gardner's North American headquarters in Columbia, Maryland, located right between uh, Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Uh, if you have not yet been able to connect to our audio, um, hopefully this slide will uh, clue you in as to how to do so, um, because of course, if that is the case, you can't hear me anyway. Okay, hopefully everybody is connected at this point. Uh, your speaker today is Viv Hanson Devil, uh, myself, Corey Cohen, Application Specialist with Dick Gardner USA uh, since February 2011, um, specializing, um, as it may be no surprise to you because this is what we're engaged in today, uh, in customer education and technical training. So just some general information about the webinar. Uh, the mute setting has been initiated by me, um, so you have all been uh, automatically muted, um, and only I can unmute you. Um, it's a terrible power to have. I will try not to abuse it. Uh, if you have any questions, we will have some time uh, after the presentation for a brief Q&A, um, so please enter any questions that you'd like me to answer in the chat function. And uh, yes, the PDF uh, version of this presentation will be sent to all participants uh, after the um, web seminar. So our agenda today, uh, first off, we'll talk about why we measure film thickness, and then we will get into methods of film thickness measurement uh, and when to use them. Um, oops. Uh, we will talk about types of film thickness gauges. And then we will finish by discussing uh, adhesion measurements um, by several different methods. So here we go, film thickness and adhesion measurement. Uh, so the definition of film thickness, according to ISO uh, 2808, uh, film thickness is the distance between the surface of the coating and the surface of the substrate. Pretty simple. Um, so why do we measure film thickness? Uh, well, there are a number of reasons. Um, we'll list just a few here. One could be um, for protection. If we have a coating um, that is meant to be a protective coating, we have to apply it um, in the proper um, thickness in order to achieve that property. Um, opacity, um, so some coatings um, may, um, you may desire opacity or you may not. Um, for coatings that you do want to achieve opacity, um, also you need to make sure you apply it in sufficient quantities to achieve that. Um, certain coatings may have functional properties that you need to make sure that the film thickness is um, appropriate for, um, as well as cost. If you're using more um, material, if your, your film thickness is higher than it needs to be, um, even if it doesn't have a detrimental effect on uh, the coating itself, um, you're still using uh, more material than you need to, and um, you're going to be spending more money than you need to. Uh, so film thickness can be measured either wet or dry. And uh, when talking specifically about dry film thickness measurement, um, certain tests can be either destructive or non-destructive. So we'll get into all these different uh, methods in a bit. Um, the appropriate method is dependent on the substrate, whether your, um, your coating is on wood, plaster, plastic, uh, or metal, or others. Um, measurements uh, can be influenced by the surface texture, um, whether it's smooth or rough, flat or wavy. Um, just be aware that different substrates with different textures um, can provide different results. Uh, so beginning with wet film thickness, um, here we have two different uh, tools, two different methods of measuring wet film thickness. On the left, we see uh, the interchemical or IC gauge, uh, which is also referred to some, uh, sometimes simply as a wet film wheel. And then on the right, we have um, some various types of comb type gauges. Um, so before we get into film thickness uh, measurement, let's talk a little bit about um, drawdowns. 
Uh, so a drawdown, of course, is when you take some sort of applicator, usually some sort of uh, metal bar um, with a gap in the bottom, and uh, you, you pull that applicator over your uh, coating, and the, um, the coating flows through the gap, um, creating a nice um, drawdown of an even thickness. Um, now, you might think that the um, thickness of the coating that you draw down is going to be equal to the gap clearance, um, because that's what I thought uh, when I first started here, but that's actually not the case. Um, so, in general, if you're dealing with a, a gap clearance of about 25 to 100 microns, you can expect that the wet film thickness you'll get from that is about half of the gap clearance. Um, now, of course, this is just an approximate. Um, this depends on um, things like the rheological properties of your coating, the viscosity and density, and things like that. Um, but this can be a, a pretty good estimate of the wet film thickness you'll get um, from these gap clearances. So half the gap clearance is if you're in uh, the 1 to 4 mil or 25 to 100 micron range. Um, if you go up to uh, between 101 and 300 microns, if that's the gap clearance, you can expect your wet film thickness will be about 60% of the gap clearance. Uh, for gap clearances in the 301 to 500 micron range, you can expect uh, the wet film thickness will be 80% of the gap clearance. Um, and for gaps greater than 500 microns, the wet film thickness will be about 90% uh, of the gap clearance. So um, as you can see, as the um, gap clearance increases, the wet film thickness as a percentage of that gap clearance um, is also going to go up. So here we have um, a diagram of a uh, interchemical or um, interchemical gauge or wet film wheel. Uh, so this type of gauge consists of an eccentric center wheel supported by two concentric outer wheels uh, to provide two scales that are bilateral symmetrical, and that just means you're going to get two readings um, every time you take a measurement. Uh, the um, range of these gauges um, in the English scale, it can go up to 30 mils, um, and if you're dealing with metric, up to uh, about 700 microns. Uh, this method tends to be very accurate for um, thin film applications, and uh, it can be used with moving surfaces. So if you have a need to take um, wet film measurements on a production line, um, and it has a stainless steel construction, for long life and ease of cleaning. Uh, so the way this works here is we have um, a wet coating indicated by this, uh, this bluish bar here, and we're taking this uh, wet film wheel, and we're going to dip it down into the, the wet coating and then roll it through. And so at a certain point, um, the uh, wet film, um, as the depth of that uh, sort of canal in the middle of those two circles um, decreases, um, that wet film, uh, the wet coating is going to make contact with the, uh, the middle of that canal, um, with sort of the bottom of it, and then that's where you would read the um, wet film thickness at the point where it made contact. Um, so you continue to roll your wet film wheel through. And then when you're done, uh, you would lift it up and you would see where it made contact and look at the scale on the side to figure out what your wet film thickness is. Um, so some test recommendations for this type of um, testing. Uh, the coating should be applied on a flat, rigid panel in a laboratory or to the actual surface being coated uh, in the field or on the production floor. Um, you want to measure the wet film thickness as quickly as possible to reduce shrinkage uh, due to solvent loss. Of course, as soon as you apply your coating, um, it's going to begin to cure, um, which involves uh, the solvents evaporating away, and the um, wet film thickness is going to begin decreasing uh, pretty much immediately. So if you want to get the most accurate uh, measurement of what your wet film thickness is at the point uh, or at the time of coating, um, you want to take this measurement as quickly as possible. So when you report the results from this type of testing, um, you want to take the mean of the opposite reading. So I mentioned that the, the film wheel is designed so that every, uh, every time you roll it through your coding, you're actually getting two different readings, and you want to take the average of those as you reported reading. Um, and you also want to report the range and smallest graduation of the gauge used. 
Um, so the repeatability of this type of gauge, if you're um, talking about measurements up to four mils, you should expect the, um, the measurements taken by the same operator with the same tool um, to agree with each other to within uh, 0.4 or 0.5 mils, uh, depending on the number of readings that you're taking. And for the reproducibility or the agreement between um, two different uh, operators taking readings with the same type of instrument, um, you can expect those readings to agree to, uh, with each other to within about 0.55 mils. Uh, so next up we have the wet film comb gauge. Um, you can see uh, a couple examples here at the bottom. These are small, flat, uh, rectangular, or hexagonal gauges. Um, they're made of metal or plastic, and they have teeth uh, with graduated clearances cut in the edges. So this is a simple, low-cost gauge, um, useful when approximate values are satisfactory, so it's not the most precise way to do it. Um, but we, we might refer to this as a quick and dirty method. So if you just need a quick, quick approximation of your wet film thickness, this is a good tool to use. Um, and we offer the ability for you to customize your wet film thickness gauges uh, with your company logo, address, phone number, or uh, any other um, text or, or visuals that you may want to see on it. Um, and then you can then take these and uh, hand them out to your customers as a sort of uh, functional business card that they can then use in their lab and, and then, you know, when they, they, it comes time they need to order some product, they can look at that, uh, that comb gauge and, and, you know, give you a call. Uh, so um, how to use the comb gauge. Um, so to take a measurement, you push the comb gauge into the film using the measuring range that corresponds to the expected film thickness. Um, so it's good to have uh, an expected range of film thicknesses um, so you can pick the correct side of this comb gauge. Um, so you dip it down into the wet film all the way until the supports on the side contact the substrate and then remove the comb gauge from the coating. And the wet film thickness will fall between the clearance of the shortest tab that is wet and the next shortest uh, dry tab. So here we have a visual example. Um, so we have a comb gauge um, with uh, four different teeth. Uh, the first one has a gap of 25 microns um, between the, the bottom and the, uh, the, the bottom of the tooth. Um, and the next one is 50 microns, then 75 and 100. So we're gonna take this and dip it down into our wet coating um, until the supports on either side uh, meet the substrate. And we'll lift it back up and analyze those teeth um, to figure out our wet film thickness. So in this example, we can see that the wet film made contact with the tooth that has the uh, 75 micron gap, um, but it did not make contact with the tooth that has the 100 micron gap. Um, so we know that our wet film reading is between 75 and 100 microns. Um, now, if, if all of the teeth make contact with the wet film or none of the teeth do, um, that means you, you chose the wrong range and uh, you need to pick a different size with a different range um, of uh, gap clearances. So once you have the wet film thickness of your coating, um, assuming you know the, the percent solid of your coating by volume, you can then uh, get a pretty good estimate of what the dry film thickness will be. Um, so as a, a pretty good estimate, you take the wet film thickness, uh, multiply it by the percent solids, and then divide by 100, um, and that should give you a pretty good estimate of your dry film thickness. Um, and as an example, if we have, uh, say, a 100 micron uh, wet film, and we know that the um, coating is 60% solids by volume, uh, we can expect that the dry coating will be about 60 microns thick. Um, so why do we measure dry film thickness again? Um, this is an essential parameter that needs to be measured routinely. Uh, it can have an impact, um, as discussed, on things like opacity, appearance, and protective properties of your coating. Um, and applying too much coating can also be detrimental because it can lead to um, excessive dry time, cracking, and flaking of the paint film, 
um, as well as cost overruns. Uh, okay, so moving on to dry film thickness measurement. So this is uh, measuring the thickness of your coating after it has fully cured. Um, so as mentioned, there are two uh, different categories of this type of test, um, non-destructive and destructive. Um, non-destructive, um, with some few exceptions, can only be done on um, coatings uh, uh, utilizing metal substrates. So either ferrous, uh, meaning the substrate contains iron, um, such as steel, or non-ferrous metals. And we have a, a, a table here listing some uh, ferrous versus non-ferrous metals. Um, and for destructive tests, if you're using a, um, a non-metal substrate, such as wood or plastic, um, that might require a non-destructive, or I'm sorry, a destructive test um, to measure the, the dry film thickness. So here is the um, measurement principle of the um, non-ferrous uh, dry film thickness gauge. Uh, so the way this gauge works, um, it has a uh, wire coiled around an iron core, um, and there's an alternating current run through the coiled wire, which induces an alternating magnetic field. Uh, now, when this probe comes near a non-magnetic metal substrate, a current is induced in the substrate, which produces a magnetic field in the opposite direction. Um, and so this causes the first magnetic field to weaken. And so the weakening of the uh, first magnetic field uh, produced by that coil uh, can then be related to the distance between the probe and the substrate, which allows us to measure the um, dry film thickness of a coating on a non-ferrous substrate. Uh, now for ferrous substrates, um, this uses what's called the uh, magnetic induction method. Um, and uh, this also consists of a wire coiled around an iron core. Um, an alternating current is run through this coiled wire, which induces an alternating magnetic field, uh, which in turn induces a voltage. Um, so when this probe, when this apparatus um, gets close to a magnetizable surface, such as a ferrous substrate, uh, the magnetic field is strengthened and the voltage increases. Uh, so by correlating the change in voltage with the distance between the probe and substrate, um, we can use this principle to measure the film thickness of a coating on a ferrous substrate. Um, and also implemented in these types of gauges is what we call the Hall effect method. Um, and this is where voltage is induced across a conductor in the presence of a magnetic field uh, with the magnitude of the voltage difference proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. Um, and so Hall effect sensors are incorporated into uh, ferrous magnetic induction sensors um, in order to provide more precise measurements. Uh, so here we have a table of when uh, to use um, ferrous dry film thickness measurement versus non-ferrous. Um, basically, if the substrate is steel or any type of um, ferrous magnetizable metal, um, you would need to use the ferrous method. Um, and any other non or any other metal substrate that is non-ferrous uh, or non-magnetizable, which actually does include some types of stainless steel, um, you would need to use the non-ferrous method. So here we have um, our newest. Uh, film thickness gauge. This is the Bico Test Lite. Uh, it sports a compact design for one hand operation. It has a color uh, display that can flip 90 or 180 degrees. Um, so it's just like how your phone screen will automatically turn depending on its orientation. Uh, so too will the screen on uh, this film thickness gauge. Uh, it has automatic substrate recognition. Um, so it does do both ferrous and non-ferrous measurements. Um, and it's not something you even need to select. It's going to automatically detect um, which type your substrate is and switch to the correct mode. 
It has a strong wear resistant Ruby probe tip for longevity. Um, it can uh, perform a zero point calibration. This is where you have uh, a metal plate, um, either a non ferrous metal plate such as aluminum or a ferrous one like steel. Uh, so remember the idea behind these gauges is it's essentially measuring the distance between uh, the probe and the metal substrate. And so if you place the probe, if you take a measurement uh, directly on it, um, some bare metal, you should get a reading of zero. Um, so the zero point calibration consists of taking a measurement of a um, flat metal plate and then adjusting the value um, to zero and that adjusts the calibration curve to be accurate. Uh, it has a key lock um, to only take readings so that if you're, you're trying to take readings with it, um, you don't actually hit some buttons and, and change some settings or anything like that. Uh, you can uh, input um, high-low tolerances um, for a task-fail warning. It has a statistic mode with a 1,000 measurement memory. Uh, it can do continuous measurement mode, uh, and it has a stability mode um, that warns the user when the instrument is tilted uh, to prevent wrong readings. Uh, next up, we have the BICO test. Um, so the last one was the BICO test light. Uh, this is the standard BICO test, which has a few more features. Um, specifically, um, in addition to measuring film thickness on ferrous and non-ferrous substrates, this can also measure uh, dew point, air temperature, and relative humidity. Um, in addition to that, it also has an SSPC specific mode for standardized measurement protocols and calibration routines, uh, which the light version does not have. Um, so again, we have this list of features, which I just went over all the same features that the um, Bico Test Lite has um, with the addition of uh, more calibration features. So in addition to doing the zero point calibration where you're, you're calibrating on bare metal, it can also do single and two point calibrations where you use a certified uh, plastic shim over that metal. Um, so it's a known film thickness that you can then use um, at one or two points to adjust the, um, that calibration curve. So if you have a, a, a shim that's, say, 50 microns, um, you would take a measurement of that shim um, and then adjust the value so it's equal to 50 microns. Uh, so what is dew point and why do we measure it? Uh, the dew point is the temperature to which air must be cooled to become saturated with water vapor. Uh, when air cools to its dew point through contact with a surface that is colder than air, water will condense on the surface. Um, and the common example that we're all familiar with is um, a uh, condensation on a cold glass. Um, if you have, uh, you know, an icy drink in a, in a glass, um, that glass is going to be much colder than the surrounding air and water will uh, condense on it from the air. Um, so the reason we care about this is because condensed water can be a problem uh, both before and after coating. Um, this can occur especially when painting structures outside where you can't control the climate. Um, and there are also systems that require moisture from the air for curing. So it's important, um, depending on your coating, to know um, what the dew point is and what the, the air temperature and relative humid humidity are. Uh, so, coatings manufacturers typically provide um, some sort of application guide um, with specifications for the um, temperature um, and humidity. Um, so, you don't want to apply your coating if, if the um, ambient air um, is outside of these ranges. And it also provides uh, specifications such as um, only apply the coating when the substrate temperature is at least three degrees Celsius or five degrees Fahrenheit uh, above the dew point. So this is why um, you need a dew point meter to measure these things so you know uh, whether you can um, properly apply your coating. Uh, so moving on to some additional models of uh, film thickness gauges that we offer. Um, here we have the BICO test 4200 or the BICO test 4500. Um, the 4200 is a ferrous only gauge, only for use um, with uh, ferrous magnetic substrates. Uh, and the 4500 um, has both types of measurements built in, both ferrous and non-ferrous. Um, so again, this has a compact design for easy handling. 
uh, one button operation, um, automatic substrate recognition again, uh, backlit graphic display for viewing under poor light conditions, that can be useful. Um, again, a wear resistant Ruby tip um, for longevity. Um, this has a V groove in the probe for measuring cylindrical parts. Um, so if you're measuring parts with any sort of curvature, it's important that the gauge is positioned properly um, on that part during measurement. And so that V groove can help uh, make sure that the, the probe is stable on the surface when measuring dry film thickness. Uh, and it also has an acoustic signal um, for measurement confirmation. So this is sort of an economic, um, just simple use gauge, um, just for simple, quick, easy readings. Uh, and Moving on from there, we have the dual scope MPOR, um, which is a highly precise and accurate uh, paint thickness gauge. Um, this also provides automatic substrate recognition, um, compact size for easy handling, large sample measurement memory. Um, there are two displays for easy view for measurement results, so you can't really see from this picture, uh, but in addition to the screen on the front, there's actually a screen on the top as well um, to view your readings. Um, and it has a magnetic induction uh, ferrous sensor, particularly suitable for the automotive industry. Um, automatic and user selectable calibration, uh, statistics functions, and an LED indicator uh, for pass-fail analysis. And that brings us to the Bigo Test 8500 which has a modular design um, to accommodate a wide, wide range of applications. Modular meaning um, you can switch out the probe uh, depending on um, what exact application uh, you're measuring. Um, so there's a basic and a premium version. Um, there, is, uh, there are versions that are ferrous only, non-ferrous only, or those that can do both. Um, it, it has an easy to use operator menu, illuminated graphical display and keypad. Um, as mentioned, exchangeable probes to measure uh, different substrates or under different conditions. Uh, also a wear-resistant Ruby sensor tip uh, and a V-groove probe um, for measuring curved or cylindrical parts, uh, automatic and user-specific calibration modes. Um, this one has optional wireless data transfer to a PC. Um, it also has automatic substrate recognition and an optional wireless sensor to measure difficult to reach areas. So one of the optional um, sensors that you can purchase it with um, that can be switched out is, um, is actually wireless. So if you have uh, a need to measure film thickness in a tight spot um, or somewhere that, that may be hard to reach with the, uh, the whole body of the instrument, you can use that wireless probe. Um, so in order to test the um, accuracy on the precision of your film thickness gauge, um, you can purchase uh, plastic shims. Um, plastic shims are, are just uh, thin plastic pieces um, with a certified thickness amount. These are traceable to either uh, NIST or BAM. Um, they're often used for ISO compliance. Um, you can buy them um, individually or in sets, and they have an individual serial number on each shim uh, for documentation. So that's all we have for film thickness. Um, so now we're going to get into, talk, I'm, I'm sorry, non-destructive film thickness. Now we're going to talk about uh, destructive film thickness tests for when a non-destructive test is not suitable for the application. And so this test consists of cutting a V-shaped groove into the surface and then measuring the uh, width of the exposed coating and relating that to the depth or the thickness of the coating. Uh, so the way to do this test is, um, uh, again, cut, uh, cut through your surface with a um, V-shaped cutter. Um, make sure you cut all the way down to the substrate. Uh, the cut is observed through a microscope with a micrometer scale. And then the thickness is calculated by the angle of the cutter and the width of the cut. Um, and one of the main benefits of this over non-destructive tests is that multiple layers can be differentiated. So whereas with uh, a non-destructive gauge, it's only measuring the total distance between the probe and the substrate. And so if you have multiple layers of coating, um, it's going to treat them, the non-destructive gauge, 
uh, we'll treat them all as, as one single layer and give you the total thickness. Uh, whereas if you're using a um, destructive method like this, uh, where you can actually uh, visually view the coding, um, you can differentiate between different layers. And so if you have a multi-layer multi system, um, you can measure the thickness of each coding layer individually. And here we have a uh, brief video for you on how to do this type of test. Okay, so you saw um, how the destructive film thickness do, uh, test is done with the um, Bico cut instrument. Um, and we also saw 
uh, a hardness test and a cross-cut adhesion test. So that tool, um, in addition to doing uh, film thickness measurement, it can do a, a few other things depending on which tool is selected. Um, we're not going to get into hardness today, but we will discuss um, that adhesion measurement. Uh, so back to destructive film thickness, here we have an example. Um, and in this example, uh, we're using the cutter number one that has a 45 degree cutting angle. Um, and from uh, this selection of the cutter, we know that um, on that reticle scale that you're using to uh, measure the, the width of the coating, we know that every division on that scale um, is equal to a depth of 20 microns. Um, so here the width is measured as 30 divisions, so we multiply those 30 divisions by 20 microns uh, and we arrive at a um, dry film thickness uh, of six, 600 microns. Okay, moving on to adhesion. Um, according to the paint testing manual from ASTM, adhesion is the state in which two surfaces are held together by interfacial forces, uh, which may consist of valence forces or interlocking action or both. Um, in simpler terms, it's simply the bond between, uh, how strong the bond is between a coating and substrate. Um, so coatings, uh, the test method um, involves removing the coating by abrading, chipping, cutting, or scraping off uh, through the use of knives, coins, or other instruments. We'll show you a couple different methods. Um, so here we have a few of them. There's the crosscut test, uh, the scrape adhesion test, and the pull-off test, depending on which uh, specific test method you're testing by. Um, the thing to know is that all of these methods are destructive. Um, adhesion um, is always a tricky thing to measure, and there is no uh, non-destructive way to do it. You always need to um, to cut into the surface or to, um, to destroy the surface in order to measure the adhesion. Uh, so for the crosscut test, um, the procedure involves making a lattice pattern, as you saw at the end of that video, um, using a sharp razor blade, scalpel, knife, or um, as in the video, a multi-cutting device um, that has uh, parallel uh, blades that all cut um, um, parallel to each other. Um, and it's important that when using these blades that you cut all the way down to the substrate for this type of testing. Um, you then want to brush in a diagonal direction to the cuts uh, five times each. Um, this is specifically according to ASCMD 3359 um, and also this ISO 2409. Um, you then apply pressure sensitive tape and remove it in one step. Uh, you don't want to take too long to do it. Between half a second and one second is good um, at an approximately 60 degree angle. Uh, and you want to do this uh, within five minutes after applying the tape. Um, so here um, you can see two examples of cutters um, at the bottom left here. We have um, on, on the left is a single edge cutter. On the right, um, that one has six edges, and they're the exact same tool. Uh, the only difference is that uh, on the, the one that's the wheel on the right, um, when one edge wears out, as they do over time, you can simply turn the wheel um, and use a different edge. So this is just uh, six sides of this cutter in one, whereas the one on the left is only one cutter. So the um, cross-cut test for adhesion, um, the kit includes a cross-cut tool, which is the, um, those wooden handles you see with the, uh, the cutters attached to them, uh, the tape, the brush, and a magnifying glass um, for evaluating the surface after the testing. Um, and as mentioned, you can use a single cutting tool or a multi-cutting tool. The results will be the same. Um, it's just uh, if you have to do many, many of these tests and these um, Cutters wear out very often. It can be more economical to get the multi-cutting tool with multiple sides. Uh, so after you make your lattice cuts in the surface, you um, do your brushing, and then you apply the tape and pull it off. Uh, then it's time to evaluate the surface according to this criteria. Um, so you evaluate the surface and give, uh, give it a rating of 0 to 5 
um, based on um, on these visuals um, and these descriptions. Um, so five, um, or well, for ISO five is the uh, worst adhesion, um, and zero is the best. And for ASTM, it's reverse. Five is the best it, or the strongest adhesion, um, and zero is the worst. Uh, now we have a video for how that was done. <laughs> So the, uh, the type of testing you just saw with that cross-cut tester, um, that was the same you saw at the end of the previous video. Um, so if you already have the BICO cut uh, instrument for measuring um, destructive dry film thickness, um, you can buy additional blades for it that can also do the cross-cut test. So you can do uh, the same cross-cut test with the BICO cut as well, um, or you can buy the standalone uh, cross-cut uh, kit as you saw here. Uh, so when doing a test report following your cross-cut test, um, the things you want to report include uh, which cutting tool that was used. There are different cutting tools with different number of um, uh, cutters and different spacing depending on the um, thickness of your coating. Um, and of course, you do want to also report the film thickness of the coating. So this is another reason to um, test the film thickness of your coating so you know which cutter to use. Uh, you want to report the test method that you followed, uh, the type of tape that was used, the number of tests that were done, and the operator. Um, so for the precision statement, your results should be considered suspect when results differ by one rating uh, for two measurements taken by one operator. So if an operator does repeated measurements on the same surface, um, he should get the same results. Um, and if you have um, different operators doing uh, multiple tests on the same surface, you should expect um, their readings to differ from each other by no more than one rating. Okay, and that brings us to our next um, adhesion test method, uh, the pull-off adhesion test. Um, so this can be used on um, uh, substrates including metal, wood, um, or any other rigid substrate. There's a, a good amount of force that needs to be applied to the, the, the coating system and the substrate in order to do this test. Um, so it must be a, a rigid substrate that can withstand those forces. Um, the test is done with a portable pull-off adhesion tester, and the strength measurement depends um, both upon the material and the instrument. The procedure is to secure a loading fixture, um, such as a dolly, which you see here in the picture on the left. 
um, perpendicular to the surface of the coating with an adhesive. So you're gluing the bottom, the flat part of the stolly onto the coating that you're testing. Um, and you would allow the adhesive to cure for an appropriate amount of time. Um, now these um, instruments do come with um, an epoxy, a, a glue, to glue your dolly down to the surface. Um, you don't necessarily have to use the glue that comes with it, but it is important that the adhesion between the dolly and the coating um, is stronger uh, than the adhesion between the coating and the substrate in order to get a, a good test. Um, so after gluing and, and making sure that glue is fully cured, um, a mechanism a mechanism is attached to the dolly, which exerts an upward force on the dolly while holding the substrate in place. So again, this is why you need a rigid substrate because uh, a, a good amount of force will be applied um, to that substrate. Uh, the applied force is measured at the point that the dolly and the coating separate from the, sub, uh, from the substrate. So it's uh, measuring the amount of force or the amount of pressure required to pull that um, the coating off. Um, uh, by way of that dolly. So these uh, pull-off testers come in a manual or automatic version. Um, in the manual version, it has a hand pump. You can see that at the top. Um, so you actually have to provide the physical force um, to pull the dolly off, whereas the automatic version on the bottom um, has a motor and a pump um, that will provide the, um, the force itself. Uh, you, these uh, dollies come in different sizes depending on the strength of your coating. Um, if, you, um, if your stri uh, coating has very high adhesive strength, you would want to use one of the smaller dollies, um, like 10, 14, or 20 millimeters. Um, if your uh, coating adhesion strength is very weak, you might need to move to one of the larger dollies to provide more, more surface area, um, such as the 50 millimeter. Um, it has a detaching assembly. Uh, as mentioned, it comes with an adhesive, which is a two-component epoxy. So you have to mix um, liquids from two different tubes to create that very strong bond, um, that, that very strong epoxy used to glue these dollies down to the coating. Um, and it also comes with a circular hole cutter um, to cut the material around the dolly in order to isolate just that um, small circle of coating and substrate that you actually want to test. Um, without the strength of the, the surrounding coating coming into it. So here are some possible test results you might get with this type of um, adhesion pull-off test. Um, so over here on the left, uh, the um, coating has failed or has pulled off um, right in the middle of the layer, and this is what's referred to as a cohesive fracture. So this is something you want to note in your test report. Um, in the middle there, we have um, the coating separate um, at the interface between two coatings. So it's, it's um, separating um, one layer from another layer, and this is referred to as an adhesive fracture. Uh, and then over the right, um, we actually have a glue failure where the, um, the coating and the glue have come off the coating, um, and, and this doesn't tell us anything about the coating at all. So this is actually a failed test. Um, that you would then need to repeat. Uh, and this is why I mentioned that it is very important that the glue that holds that dolly onto the coating um, is stronger than the adhesion between the coating and substrate or the coating and the next layer down. Um, otherwise, when you, you do the test, it's just going to pull that glue off and you're, uh, you're not going to actually be testing your surface. So your report for the pull-off adhesion test should include things like the temperature, humidity, or any other environmental conditions that you may um, consider important, um, a description of the apparatus, including the uh, manufacturer and model number, and for example, whether it was uh, a um, manual pump test or an automatic test, uh, a description of the test system, uh, the date, test location and testing agent, um, whether the, uh, the test resulted in a pass or a fail, and uh, note the plane of failure, um, as mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and of course, the test result, which is the um, amount of pressure or the amount of force that was required to pull that um, the dolly off of the, the substrate. Um, 
you know, of course, any specific comments or corrections made to the system that you may think are important to note. Um, so here is an example. We have a multi-layer automotive coding system. Um, so since these types of coatings are often done on uh, metal substrates, you can do a non-destructive film thickness measurement, um, which measures the total film thickness. So again, that's not going to differentiate between different layers. It's only t um, telling you the total thickness of all the layers put together. Um, so if you want to be able to differentiate between the different layers in an automotive coating system, for example, the E-coat, primer, and base coat, um, that would necessitate doing a destructive film thickness measurement where you actually cut into the coating um, and can um, actually visually observe um, the different layers and measure them individually. Um, and also on this type of system, um, and a uh, cross-cut adhesion test can also be useful to make sure that the uh, coating is adhering to the, the substrate and that the different layers are adhering to each other as appropriate. So that is all the uh, material I have for you today. Um, here what you're seeing, all these beautiful people comprise uh, Big Gardner's technical service team, including um, those of us here in the U.S., uh, as well as my colleagues over at our international headquarters in Germany. Um, we would be happy to uh, answer any questions or discuss your application at any time. Uh, you don't have to wait for a web seminar to get your questions answered. That's why we have um, each of our direct phone lines and emails here. Um, so feel free to reach out if you'd uh, like to discuss your application with us. Uh, so our next web seminar uh, will be on the uh, basic building blocks of color. Um, that'll be sometime in mid-August. Please check out our website um, for details and to register. Uh, we also, uh, in better times, when we're able to travel, uh, we like to provide on-site seminars. Um, so if you have a desire for us to um, come to you and give a, um, an actual on-site seminar, and we can uh, customize the presentation specifically for your needs, and we can bring our instruments with us and show them to you and allow you to, to actually see them in use and, and uh, you know, pick them up and, and use them yourself. We have a new website at uh, byk-instruments.com. Please check it out. Um, and we also have plenty of videos on YouTube, which you can find at uh, youtube.com slash user slash BIC video. Um, many of these um, videos are also now available on our website, including the ones I just showed you. Um, so you can go directly to uh, BIC-instruments.com and um, look for our videos there. Um, that can be very useful for uh, first-time users just to get a visual of, of how these things are actually used, um, as you saw in this web seminar. And of course, if you happen to be in the area, we'd love to host you at uh, one of our offices. Here at the top left, um, we have our North American headquarters in uh, lovely Columbia, Maryland. It's located right near uh, Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, so plenty to see and do around here, and we'd love to have you in um, and show you around, um, as well as discussing any, any questions or needs you may have. Um, and then at the bottom left there, we have our international headquarters in Garrett Street, Germany. Um, this is our primary production facility, um, and so similarly, my colleagues over in Germany um, would love to um, show you around the production facilities and the R&D facilities. Um, and also discuss uh, with the only person any needs you may have. Um, it's located uh, in Bavaria, a lovely countryside right near the Alps. Um, if you have the opportunity to visit, I, I definitely recommend it. Um, and of course, they have delicious, delicious beer, which I also very highly recommend. Okay, and with that, uh, that ends my presentation, and we will move on to the Q&A. So we have a question, what is the lowest 
film thickness that non-destructive gauges can measure. Um, these gauges actually can measure all the way down to zero, so I do not believe there is a lower limit um, to what it can measure. Of course, there is a um, inherent uncertainty in the measurement, as there is with any type of measurement. Um, so if your um, coding is, say, one micron thick, you may not be able to get an accurate measurement, um, considering the repeatability of the instrument. Um, but for the most part, yeah, all, all the way down to um, very close to zero. Uh, someone has asked, how critical is the accuracy if we use a non-ferrous device to measure a ferrous substrate coating? Um, the answer is you cannot. Um, if you use a non-ferrous device um, to try to measure a coating on a ferrous substrate, it will tell you, um, usually it will give you the indication INFI, infinity, meaning it is not actually sensing any substrate, and so the reading is essentially infinite. Um, so, yes, you, you do need to use the appropriate probe um, for the substrate that you have, um, otherwise you will not get any reading at all. Is it possible to measure coating thickness over non-flat surfaces? Um, it is, um, and as mentioned, we have several uh, gauges that have that D groove um, to allow you to properly position it on curved surfaces. Um, one thing to note, though, is that um, you really only want to compare similar um, surfaces to other similar surfaces. So if, if you um, compare two readings uh, on, say, a substrate with very high curvature versus another substrate with very low curvature, even if the film thickness is actually the same, you might get slight differences. Um, so it's always good to compare apples to apples. Um, and the best way to measure such surfaces is actually to um, calibrate, uh, do the zero calibration um, directly on the substrate you'll be measuring. So if, you'll, if you're um, measuring on a curved substrate, um, if you can ha uh, have a bare substrate that you can actually do the zero calibration on, that's the, the best way to get accurate measurements. Um, and that actually applies to the type of metal substrate as well. Um, so most of these gauges um, we provide um, these metal plates for you to do the zero calibration on, um, but best practice actually is to calibrate directly on the metal um, substrate that you're using during measurement, um, and that will provide the most accurate values. Is there an instrument that measures film thickness on composite substrates? And uh, he's asking specifically about non-destructive measurement. Um, there is one gauge that can do that. Um, it uses a sonic principle rather than a, a magnetic or electrical principle to measure um, uh, measure the film thickness. Um, it essentially works like sonar. It, it sends sound waves into the surface and measures the reflection um, when it hits materials of different density. Um, but those can be a bit tricky. It doesn't work on everything. Um, generally, I like to test samples before recommending that instrument. Um, so I would encourage you to um, shoot me an email and uh, we can get together and maybe um, you can send me some samples for testing and we can figure out what the best way is to move forward. Are these expensive? Um, I guess that's relative. I would say no, um, particularly our newest models. Um, I believe we are, are still running um, promotions on our, our BICO test and BICO test light models, so I encourage you to contact us about that or to look on our website. Uh, irregular surfaces such as a threaded bar. Um, so you're talking about film thickness measurement on a threaded bar. Um, I'd say it can be done, um, but again, apples to apples, um, you, you would always only want to compare measurements um, taken on a, a similar substrate. Um, I would also say on a threaded bar that could provide um, significant variation from reading to reading. And so I would recommend taking um, several readings and averaging them in order to get the most consistent readings possible. Uh, 
if you have questions about the adhesion test, I would encourage you to um, email me directly. Um, and uh, again, you'll, you'll find that email in this presentation, which will be distributed to you um, after we're done. I don't believe the videos will be included um, in this presentation um, because it's being sent out as a PDF version. It might include the links to the videos, um, but they can be found on our website uh, at byk-instruments, byk-instruments.com, um, and then click support and look for videos. The crosscut test, the cutter sometimes doesn't give lines in the middle. Um, what to do with that? I would say that um, that is probably due to your, um, uh, the material that you're testing not being completely flat, perhaps, um, because those cutters are very rigid and it's, it's only going to cut, they're, they're parallel with each other and so they're only going to cut through um, if, if it's a very flat um, coating and substrate. Um, so you might try um, uh, pressing it onto a flat surface and make sure that it's as flat as possible in order to get the, uh, the proper number of cuts. Can you unmute us? Great, uh, with great power comes great responsibility, so I'm, I'm afraid no. Um, okay, I think um, that is all the time we have for today. I hope this was educational for all of you. Um, the PDFs will, uh, of this presentation will be sent out to all of you. Um, if you have any questions, please contact us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.